Canada, a people's history. Proudly presented with the corporate partnership support of Sun Life Financial, Ascenda, and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. In 1858, a young boy leaves his home in the prairies bound for Montreal. His adoring mother hopes he will return a priest. 13-year-old Louis Riel is known as one of the brightest boys in Red River. He has been sent to the Collège de Montréal. His schoolmates are fascinated by his exotic background. A young man who knew about pemmican and the tomahawk and had seen the long hair of the Sioux. While Louis is still at school, his father dies suddenly, leaving his large family to fend for itself. Overcome with despair, Louis writes home to his sisters. The news plunged me into the depths of sorrow. I was advised not to write immediately so as not to sadden you too much. But I cannot contain myself any longer. Let us cry, now and forever. But Louis Riel soon recovers and makes a decision that will change the destiny of a people and a country. A new dominion is scarcely born when old hatreds test its fragile bonds. A ringing call for tolerance is silenced by a cold-blooded assassin. This is a story of a people who refuse to submit to the laws of another. And a prairie province born of an armed uprising. A story of great personal triumph and bitter defeat. The completion of a dream to build a railway and a country from sea to sea. It is 1867. Sir John A. Macdonald is the newly elected Prime Minister of Canada. At his side, his powerful Quebec ally, Georges-Étienne Cartier. Four provinces make up the Dominion. On the East Coast, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, with 600,000 people in total. Quebec with just over a million, 80% of them French-speaking. And Ontario, one and a half million and growing rapidly. 
Though the young dominion is beginning to take shape, there are still great divisions among its citizens. Language and religion create fault lines that few cross. One who believes the new country can be built on mutual respect and tolerance is an energetic Irishman named Darcy McGee. I see in the not remote distance one great nationality, bound like the shield of Achilles by the blue rim of ocean. The peaks of the western mountains and the crests of the eastern waves, I see a generation of industrious, contented, moral men, free in name and fact. McGee has been elected to Parliament with the help of the Irish of West Montreal. He has a rare talent for getting along with all members of the fractious house. He is admired as a writer of history, a poet, and raconteur. But some view McGee with deep suspicion. Once a rebel in Ireland, he now condemns violence and all secret societies that preach it. Avoid as you would avoid the jaws of hell, the secret brotherhood, whose deeds are deeds of darkness, repugnant alike to the laws of man and laws of God. His views put him on a collision course with the Fenian Brotherhood, fighting to free Ireland from Britain. Fenian sympathizers in the US and Canada call him a turncoat. I can see through you well, McGee, for you are as transparent as glass. I am a Fenian, and I give you civil warning that if you ever again speak of us in public, as you did the other evening, a few Fenians and I at their head will give you something that you will recollect. On April 5th, 1868, McGee tells a friend of a troubling nightmare. I dreamed that I stood on the bank near the falls of Niagara, where I saw two men in a boat gliding towards the falls. I rushed to the brink and shouted, to attract their attention. Then they picked up their oars and rowed up the stream, and I went over the falls. The next day, he attends a sitting on Parliament Hill that runs late into the night. It is just after 2 a.m. when he turns the key to his Spark Street boarding house. The Prime Minister's wife, Agnes MacDonald, is among the first to hear the shocking news. This is how it was, that dreadful night at half past two o'clock. My husband came home from a late sitting I was almost half asleep when I was roused by a low, rapid knocking on the front door. In an instant, a great fear came upon me. Springing up, I ran into my dressing room just in time to see John throw up the window and to hear him call out, is anything the matter? The answer came up, clear and hard in the cold moonlight morning. McGee is murdered lying in the street, shot through the head. The words fell like the blow of a bar of iron across my heart.
Within 24 hours, police have arrested James Patrick Whalen, whom they assume to be a Fenian. In his pocket, they find a revolver that has recently been fired. McDonald is furious at the Fenians. Civil rights have been suspended. And now hundreds of Irish are arrested and thrown into the Ottawa jail, where they sit for days and weeks without charges. It is enough to be Irish and Catholic and living in Ottawa to be under suspicion. Whelan protests his innocence, but he is convicted. Agnes MacDonald is stunned at the passivity of the prisoner. They tell me he cannot feel. Whelan felt. The man found guilty of a cold-blooded, crafty midnight murder. The man who for months must have tracked a fellow creature who never harmed him by word, thought, or deed and deliberately shot him dead. Yes, even that ruffian felt. On February 11th, 1869, James Patrick Whalen goes to the gallows. Thousands turned out for the funeral of Darcy McGee. There were no calls for revenge, only mourning for a beloved politician with a poet's heart. I dreamed a dream when the woods were green, and my April heart made an April scene in the far, far distant land. That even I might something do that would keep my memory for the true and my name from the spoiler's hand. The murder of McGee causes a hardening at the top levels of government. John A. MacDonald is deeply affected by his friend's death. He will not tolerate those who seek to change society by the barrel of a gun. Eighteen sixty six. Louis Riel has decided to abandon his studies at the Collège de Montréal. Instead, he apprentices at a law office in the city and falls in love. Monsieur Louis Riel, adult male, and Mademoiselle Marie-Julie Guernot, adult female, promise and resolve to take each other as husband and wife. But the parents of Marie Guernot break off the engagement when they learn Riel is Métis part Indian and part French. Angry and disappointed, Louis Riel leaves Montreal. He is heading back to Red River and a fateful confrontation. In the birthplace of Louis Riel, a dispute has erupted over the land. The Hudson's Bay Company lease on the whole region of Rupert's land is about to expire. The British would like Canada to take over the territory. But no one tells the 8,000 French and English Métis, or the Indian population, what will happen to them. In anticipation of the transfer, settlers have been streaming in from the east eager to claim a plot on the prairie. 
Charles Mayer, a journalist and Canadian nationalist, dreams of a new Ontario on the prairies. English, Protestant, and white. He encourages others to follow him. Farming here is a pleasure. There is no toil in it. All who do farm are comfortable and become wealthy. The half-breeds are the only people here who are starving. 5,000 of them have had to be fed this winter, and it's their own fault. But the Métis are about to stop the settlers in their tracks. It was early Sunday morning before sunrise when I saw my birthplace again. It was such a beautiful day. In 1868, Louis Riel arrives back in Red River. The last time his family saw him, he was barely in his teens. Now he is a grown man of 24, bilingual, educated, worldly. He is expected to lead the family since his father is dead. But provocative acts by the government of Canada soon throw Louis Riel into a much bigger role. For some time now, surveyors have been marking lots for future settlement by Easterners, though Canada has no authority here yet. The head of surveys makes his report. Further progress with the survey had been stopped by a band of some 18 French half-breeds, headed by a man named Louis Riel. Mr. Webb was ordered by the leader of the party at once to desist from further running the line. They have come here to chase us from our homeland. They assume that after 50 years of civilization, our society has borne no fruit. Instead of respecting the laws established in the colony, they have publicly repudiated them. Riel gains instant stature. Now he must get Ottawa's attention before the land is transferred to Canada. Supporters gather around him, ready to follow his lead, ready to take a risky and decisive step. On November 2nd, 1869, Riel sets off with armed supporters. They have decided to seize the Hudson's Bay headquarters at Fort Garry, the key to controlling the Red River region. Governor William McTavish has no troops to challenge Riel. Instead, he watches helplessly from his study. As I close this letter, a party of 100 of the malcontents have arrived and taken possession of Fort Garry. Guards are posted at each gate and parade the platforms. They give assurance that nothing will be touched and nothing taken. From what provision they require, they offer to pay in the name of the Council of the Republic of Half-Breeds. In the early days, Riel and his advisors extend a hand to all residents. We want to form a provisional government for our protection. We invite you to join with us sincerely. That government will be composed equally of French and English. At the many community meetings, it seems for a time as if even some English residents are listening. But James Ross, an English Métis, fears everything is moving too quickly. Your acts are now acts of rebellion. We shall draw down on the colony misfortunes such as it has never known. If we are rebels, we are rebelling against the company which is selling us and against Canada which wants to buy us. We are not rebelling against the British government. We are loyal to our homeland. 
From their secure position inside the fort, the Métis guards dig in and wait to see how Ottawa will react. In Ottawa, John A. Macdonald has heard about the trouble on the frontier. These impulsive half-breeds have got spoilt and must be kept down by a strong hand until they are swamped by the influx of settlers. He has already appointed a lieutenant governor for the region. William McDougall sets off for Red River in regal fashion. His luggage requires 14 wagons. He has brought his own piano and a custom toilet seat. McDougall and his entourage must travel through the U.S. to get to Red River. But when they arrive at the border, Métis guards are waiting for them. The Catholic nuns observe the mounting tension. War is upon us. The Miti have barricaded all the roads and would sooner spill blood than let these men enter the country. How admirable to see the spirit which animates our noble Miti. William McDougall does not yet have the authority to claim the land for Canada. But that doesn't stop him. He crosses the border and reads his proclamation aloud, though no one is there to listen. Her Majesty the Queen has been graciously pleased to appoint me for the admission of Rupert's land into the Union or Dominion of Canada to be Lieutenant Governor during Her Majesty's pleasure. He issues an order to surveyor John Stoughton Dennis, raise an army and drive Riel and his Métis out of Fort Garry. Assault, fire upon, or break into any fort or other place in which the said armed men may be found. A growing number of Ontario settlers are ready to join an attack on the Métis. John Christian Schultz has been stirring up the English population, especially a young hothead named Thomas Scott. There is a rumor of a price on Riel's head. But Riel takes matters into his own hands. In early December, he seizes Schultz and 56 of his followers and throws them in Fort Garry, ending any serious resistance for now. 